only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5 p.m. on Friday, the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. I'm Martin Daubney. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And why it matters to you. From your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. Good afternoon, Britain. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. A very good evening to you. I'm Sam Francis in the GB newsroom, 7 o'clock, and a quick recap of the headlines this hour. Russia's Black Sea fleet is now functionally inactive, according to the UK's Defence Secretary. That's after a massive Ukrainian missile strike on Sevastopol. For those watching on television, this was the moment that two Russian Navy vessels were targeted and then struck. <laughs> sources have told GB News that UK-supplied Storm Shadow missiles were used in that strike. And we understand a major military communication centre was also damaged. It marks the largest attack on the Russian-controlled port in the war so far, as tensions in the region continue to escalate. Meanwhile, four suspects have been taken into Russia's investigative committee headquarters today following Friday's terror attack in Moscow. The Islamic State group has claimed responsibility for the shooting, which we now know has killed at least 130 people. The US, meanwhile, has backed that claim, but Russia is continuing to suggest that Ukraine was involved, allegations that Kyiv has denied. And we've heard tonight that a boy aged just 12 years old has been charged with attempted murder after a teenage girl was stabbed in Kent. The incident happened in Sittingbourne shortly before four o'clock on Friday afternoon. The victim, we understand, was taken to a hospital in London to re receive treatment. She is now, though, in a stable condition. The boy, who cannot be named for legal reasons, will appear in court on Monday. In other news, Simon Harris has been confirmed as the new leader of the Fine Gael party, paving the way for him to become Ireland's youngest premier. It follows the surprise resignation of Leo Varadkar on Wednesday of this week for what he described as personal and political reasons. Mr Harris is expected to become Ireland's youngest Taoiseach after the Easter recess. He said today that politics should be a force for good. Hope. Enterprise. Equality of opportunity integrity and security. I have been in this party since I was 15 years old and those values mean and meant everything to me because I believe in public service. I believe in the power of politics to make a difference. I believe that politics as a profession can make people's lives better. 
In London, the British Museum was forced to close today as hundreds of pro-Palestine and environmental protesters gathered outside. Activists were seen waving banners and Palestinian flags and shouting, hands off the Middle East. The group calling itself the Energy Embargo for Palestine say they will keep targeting the museum until it ends its £50 million partnership with the oil giant BP. Eight people have been rescued after their fishing boat sank off the coast of Shetland, triggering a major rescue effort. A lifeboat and two helicopters, one from Norway, were scrambled to the scene after the 27-metre vessel activated its distress beacon early this morning. It had started taking on water in rough seas and sank within a matter of minutes. The early morning call-out did save all the crew on board who were safely airlifted from their life rafts and we understand they are reported to be in a good condition. And finally, fast food was given a new meaning in Paris today as cafe staff took part in a traditional waiter's race. The famous challenge returned this afternoon after a 13-year break. Around 200 waiters raced through the city streets, carefully balancing a tray with a pastry, a cup of coffee and a glass of tap water on board. It was first held in 1914 and even today the running waiters are still expected to dress for the occasion. This year's winners went home with a complimentary meal and tickets to the Paris Olympics. Those are the headlines. I'll be back in the next hour. In the meantime, you can sign up to GB News Alerts. Just scan the QR code there on your screen or go to our website, gbnews.com alerts. Now, though, it's time for Free Speech Nation. The countdown begins towards Scotland's new hate speech law. A government adviser calls for bans on protests outside of schools. And trans activists get violent again. This is Free Speech Nation. Welcome to Free Speech Nation with me, Andrew Doyle. This is a show where we take a look at culture, current affairs and politics. And of course, we'll have the latest from those lovable culture warriors as they busily try to suck the joy from every facet of human existence. Coming up on the show tonight, we're going to be speaking to a councillor who ran into trouble when she had the audacity to ask why gender critical campaigners were blocked from having a stall at a women weekend. I will also be joined in the studio by Sal Grover, who has been taken to court in Australia for not allowing a male to use a female only platform and we'll hear from parents and clinicians who are issuing legal challenges this week to the controversial new treatment regime for young people who question their gender and of course I've got a fantastic comedian panel here tonight to answer questions from this rather lovely studio audience and the comedians joining me tonight are Josh Howie and Lewis Schaefer Thanks for joining me both. how are you are you having a good week I'm great yeah just getting my flat ready to sell Oh, you're selling your house and you're going to use tonight to plug it? Yes, if yeah. anybody wants to move to Hornsey, yeah. let me know. How are you going to get all the board games out of your house? You've got thousands. People don't know this about Josh. He's got thousands and thousands of board games. I have games. a mental health issue. Yes. And <laughs> uh, I'm storing them in a, in a friend's loft. Are you? Is that right? OK. <laughs> and you, Lewis, good week? I never played board games. No. I've got a mental health issue. <laughs> you should, well, I wouldn't disagree with that, but I think yeah. you should try and play some board games. I Maybe I'll get invited over to Josh's no. house to me. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm afraid that's been ruled out. Uh, we have got some questions from the audience. Let's get a question from Helen. Hi, Helen. Hello. Hi. Um, is it right that protests outside of schools should be talked about being banned. Yeah, this is this official review uh, which has come this week from the government saying that they, they should ban. And this is because of the Batley Grammar School. Uh, I don't know if you remember this story. There was a teacher at the Batley Grammar School in West Yorkshire who showed a cartoon of the Prophet Muhammad in a lesson about free speech. And of course that's relevant because he was talking about what happened at uh, the Charlie Hebdo magazine. Uh, but there were protests. Do you remember those images of people outside the school? Do you remember that he was forced into hiding? That was three years ago. That teacher is still in hiding uh, at the moment. Um, and this is a special uh, independent review by Dame Sarah Khan. You've seen the review, Josh. You're familiar with this story? Yeah, uh, it's, it's very upsetting. Even when you read it still three years later, um, the, he was failed by the school who suspended him. Yes. Uh, initially, he was failed by the police who didn't defend him and he received death threats and him yes. and his family. And he was failed by the council who didn't step up at all. Yes. So this, I would argue, is, is a good step. They, I think there's 15 points in this report, one of them being that you shouldn't be able to protest outside schools, intimidate teachers, uh, unless it's uh, the school's uh, 
on strike. But uh, well, Helen, can I ask you, what do you think about this? Do you think we should have protests outside of schools? Well, yes, I do, actually, because I think children learn through observing and experiencing the real world. And I think they need to be able to see what goes on. So this is a question, isn't it, about the nature of the protest? Because, uh, Lewis, when it comes to schools, do you think it's about protecting children? Do you think there needs to be a, a, a space where they don't get intimidated by this kind of thing? Well, I mean, when you think about th what this protest is, it's basically... Uh, th I mean, I know the teacher isn't there anymore. Yes. But uh, it's it's basically a threat to every single teacher in the entire school. Well, the people mm. protesting uh, didn't send the threats. The guy did get threats from other yeah. sources. But even so, it's a, it's an angry mob outside of school. I mean, is there... You see, this is that my... my mm. I'm torn on this, Josh, as you can imagine. I think peaceful protest is really important and that we should never crack down on it. But what do you take of, of Helen's but, point? Well, though? I just... But I think it's intimidation. And in terms of what the children are learning, they're learning that a group of people um, can intimidate others into, in this case, blasphemy laws, which so, I think is wrong. Well, I would suggest that the problem actually isn't the protest. The problem is the school, the unions, the government, the, the police capitulating. What should have happened is that school should have said, no, that he doesn't lose his job. You can protest all you like, but, but he did the right thing. We're going to allow him to do what he does and for people to, you know, stand up for I him. I agree basically. with that, yeah. But, in, but it, just the, the real world lesson they learnt is that uh, a few very vocal voices uh, can shut down our freedoms. The, this is a problem, isn't it, Lewis? I mean, the point is, we had the same with The Lady of Heaven, the film that was deemed to be blasphemous, and there yeah. were mobs outside of uh, various cinemas, and there was that awful footage of the cinema manager coming out, grovelling, basically saying, no, I would never want to offend anyone's religion, so yeah. of course we won't show it. No, of course we should show it. You know, as soon as that happens, that film should be shown everywhere. Well, it's not... You know what the problem is? It's like death by a thousand cuts. It's like this is just one incident where the police and the state and the people haven't backed up so, you know, what is the, the guy in the movie theatre? Is he supposed to, like, be the single guy that defends... Well, that's it. No, right? no, I, no, I is... sympathise with that, because yeah. it, the threat is real. You know, like, people do get hurt and killed uh, by extremists. But if everyone did, that's my whole point, yeah. if everyone did it, the threat is then spread. I mean, that's my right. point. I so at what point do we say it's not going to happen, that there isn't going to be a defence of liberty? in this country? Yes. At what point? But if I could say this thing, because I said it the other day, is that... He, he was... He, he, he shouldn't have... Everybody knows you'd... You know, Just say yeah. Islamist. Come on, yeah, man. He, Every single time he, he, he can't say the word. Yeah. He can't say the word. I actually don't agree with Lewis here. I think in a, in a lesson about free speech, with one of the biggest free speech issues of a time, the murder of cartoonists for lampooning a religious figure, of course you should show the images, right? Of course you should. And a, and a French teacher was beheaded the year before. Yes. So that's why this person is in hiding, as well as actually receiving death threats. And uh, But I, I do agree with Lewis. It is, it's death by a thousand paper cuts. Hopefully now the government are trying to put some gloves on, maybe? I don't know if well, the analogy we'll, continues. I'm not sure. We'll see no, what happens. No. Let's move on to a question from Kai. Kay. Kay. Hi, Kay. Should we be concerned about Scotland's new hate crime laws? Scotland's new hate crime laws. It's one of my favourite subjects. Uh, Kai, do, OK, sorry, do you think that these are draconian? I think they are, but... Yeah, it's basically policing people's thoughts and, from what I understand, the definition of hate is hate, so it's a circular definition. Yeah. It's a real problem at the moment in Scotland. I mean, that, so it's actually, weirdly, so April the 1st... So April Fool's Day is when these laws come into effect. I don't know if the Scottish government is trolling us or whatever, but these have been in, in, uh, in, the, in the pipeline for a few years now. You know, they were developed in the, uh, into early 2020 by Humza Youssef, who was then uh, Justice Secretary. He's now First Minister, of course. The, the, the new hate crime bill in Scotland is really, really draconian. It effectively says that, we're, that anyone who perceives that some offence has been caused regarding the protected characteristics, uh, race, uh, gender, sexual orientation, um, the other one is actually transgender identity, which deviates from the Equality Act, which doesn't have that. Uh, but noticeably, the Scottish Government has, has not mentioned sex, which suggests to me, Josh, that this is really a, 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 a hate speech law to criminalise people who want to call a man a man. Well, you know, that, that... But, 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 like when trans activists, who are the most ferocious uh, and, and the most hateful uh, group at the moment when it comes certainly to these kind to of you. things... Certainly to me. Um, <laughs> When they put up signs saying decapitate turfs and stuff like that, if the hate speech law doesn't say anything about sex as a protected characteristic, it's almost like saying you get a free pass 
but no one else. Yeah, of course, it's, it's hypocritical. To be fair, they are saying that they're going to bring in some misogyny laws later, but you would think at the time, with all these other protected characteristics, that they would go, oh, women, they also get hate. But, but shouldn't we just have no hate speech laws at all? Shouldn't be, 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 people be able to say whatever they want? I mean, this crime is... This, this is crim they're effectively criminalising opinions. I think they're, they're, the police are saying that they will be obliged to investigate every complaint. So any activist... And let's face it, this is the activist's... Uh, modus operandi. They will phone up and make vexatious complaints about people they don't like. They will say, I was misgendered. Do something about it. Isn't that what's going to happen here? Well, that's what we're going to see is what's going to happen. We're seeing the police receiving this training that is ridiculous. They said when they were forming the laws and the bill that they, they it wouldn't apply to art, and uh, but now suddenly they're going, oh, we're actually going to look into comedians and go... Well, they didn't say that. Actually, they didn't say that. The, the, the bill used to have a section called public performance of a play. Mm. So they always said they were going to go after the arts. Um, what they're now saying is they won't target comedians and actors, but the training to police has shown that they are preparing for such a scenario. So they might not target a comedian for telling an offensive joke, but what they will do is they will investigate a complaint about a comedian for telling an, uh, uh, an offensive joke. Can we say the, what we're doing? Yeah, we can yeah. say what we're doing. Go for okay, it. OK, well, we, uh, there's going to be a show up on that day, on April 1st, uh, with a bunch of comics. Uh, trying to incite a lot of hate. OK, I should probably <laughs> clarify. My Phoenix, So, I have a comedy night called Comedy Unleashed in London, and I thought what I would do is take that up to Edinburgh on the 1st of April with some problematic comedians, including Josh and Lewis, and uh, we're going to see what happens. I mean, it is, it is possible we'll get arrested, but I don't think so. What do you, you don't think? You don't think so, but the way, you know, you come on this programme and you think you're going to be arrested, I don't want to go. And, well, uh, Lewis, you promised, go. you said you would do it now. I promised, because you're my boss. All my income comes from you, yes. Andrew. We and could so share you, a cell. What it would be fun. Yeah, what <laughs> Life You're long, very offensive. A lifelong dream. I don't, I don't think I'm that expensive. What, what's, what's horrible about this, this is, first of all, this has to do with Scotland. It's not my country. I'm, I'm not even English. I'm not even British. I'm from America. What do I care? It's not none of my business. But it's but not good. But you can good. still have an opinion on it, can't I you? I can have an opinion, but if you know what, if they want to be crazy, that's their business. That's what I'm going to tell the audience. I'm sorry. You shouldn't, yeah. you shouldn't have brought me there. But if they, <laughs> want, if they want to be ridiculous like that. But the basic, the core belief of this bill is something you haven't talked about, which is maybe you have. People should be allowed to hate. Yeah. I believe that. I believe you should be. You're saying, oh, this person hated me. Well, I've been hated my entire life. And, yeah. and Lewis, you say this. I have actually written about yeah. this recently, saying yeah. you shouldn't. The police are not going to be able to criminalize, criminalize an emotion, a human emotion. Yeah. You would have to undo thousands of years of human evolution yeah. to get rid of hate. Uh, the idea, the Josh. Is, can I just can I make yeah, one yeah, more yeah. point? You can if you're brief. The, the organization is called Police Scotland. That is the that is the um, the the league, whatever. That's the police department of Scotland. It's yeah. called Police Scotland, and that's basically an imperative. They're basically telling the police. Would your police Scotland, please, yeah, yeah. do something other than this. Explain to me this, though, Josh. I mean, one of the issues I have with all of this is that the SNP seem to be essentially authoritarian. I mean, they seem to believe that the citizens that they are, are, are looking after, apparently, are they're like their parents. You know, they introduced the name person scheme so that every child in Scotland would have a, a state guardian, thankfully got overturned. Uh, but now they're basically, they're, they're, they're trying to... Well, let me give you a very good example of this. So the Scottish police created a thing called the Hate Monster. Uh, and this is like this kind of mascot to teach the, the, the adults of Scotland, that they mustn't say n nasty things or hurty words. I think we've got a clip of this, have we? He'll make you want to have a go at somebody. A neighbour, somebody on the street, on a night out. Security guy on the door, somebody in the chappy, your taxi driver. He'll make you want to vent your anger, just cos folk look or act different for you. The hate monster wants you to feel what you need to show. You're better than them. Then, before you know it, you've committed a hate crime. I think this says an awful lot mm. about the way the SNP see the public. They see mm. them as children. They need to be coddled. They need to be told what words they can say, what they, what they can't. And Lewis is right, isn't it? You, uh, if you're going to criminalise hate, you should try and criminalise uh, envy and, and wrath and other human emotions that you don't happen to like. Yeah, I mean, that, that makes me want to eat some cereal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I can see that. From yeah. that. But yeah, it's uh, it's patronising, um, and it's this whole idea also of offence, of course, being taken, not given. Yeah. Uh, it's like they can't trust people to be able to read between the lines what is genuinely hateful or not. Or but who cares? 
No, no, I well, mean, if, if people say something hateful about me, as they often do, I don't call the police about it, I just block them. Yeah, uh, and then they get really upset and they say, can you tell Andrew to unblock me, please? Well, uh, that's their problem. <laughs> they, shouldn't have, they shouldn't have been hateful. They but, shouldn't have had the hate monster inside them. Yeah, it, but the, the thing is, of course, like, they think they're doing it with good intention, but when yeah. this stuff actually comes out in law and it's not probably, properly codified, it's just like with their ID D laws and whatnot, then yeah. you immediately they, people would, you know, said, look, this, men are going to self-ID into female prisons. And they were like, no, 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 this stuff wouldn't happen. As yeah. soon as it gets passed, that's exactly what happened. And they're, they're going to say, yeah. oh, no, we're not going to arrest comments and, and people in their homes or anything like that. And as soon as this stuff goes through, you're going to have some stupid policeman who thinks they know better than everybody else, and they're going to use these laws wrongly. Well, I mean, activists are already boasting online about how on April the 1st they're going to all complain about J.K. Rowling uh, for the crime of misgendering, and we'll see if anything happens. She's based in Edinburgh, so we'll see what happens. Uh, scary, scary stuff. Next question is from Heather. Hi. Um, this is another question about a violent protest. This time, this violent protest took... A, um, took place outside a, a medical conference yesterday yeah. in central London. You, I mean, why, why is violent protest so OK outside of a medical conference, including an NHS GP? Yeah, th I mean, this is... So we, a, a lot of footage has been going around online, which we can't show at the moment because there have been some arrests, uh, but they were effectively a group of uh, trans rights protesters attempting to disrupt a conference on gender issues. This was the uh, clinical advisory network on sex and gender. And they were, it was just a bunch of medical practitioners discussing issues about the dangers of, of drugs for children, puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones, all of those kinds of things, which we've discussed on this show an awful lot, uh, which the BBC haven't discussed at all. Um, w Josh, very quickly on this, um, and we want to talk about this in an abstract way, I think, because we shouldn't talk about what specifically happened because there have been arrests and we don't want to prejudice any trial that might happen. But why is it that activists, trans activists, are getting more violent. Every time I see footage of one of these protests, there's more punching, there's more I, kicking. I actually disagree with you. I think it's been violent from the very beginning. I think one of the first clips that got me to examine what was going on here was maybe five years ago or something, where a trans woman punched a man, basically punched a, a lesbian in the face. Yeah. And everybody was blaming this woman and saying that she was a bigot. And I'm like, that's a bloke just punched a woman in the face. Yeah. And then we saw the same in New Zealand and that yeah. guy just got off. I, I think what I'm suggesting is not that it hasn't been there from the start, but that it's escalating. And I think it might be because of the revelations of the WPATH files, because of the close of the Tavistock, because more and more people are seeing, opening their eyes to this. And I think a, a cornered rat lashes out. I think they're getting, I think they're seeing the death of their movement and they're going to get more aggressive. More desperate. More desperate, maybe. What do you think, Lewis? I don't think so. I don't think... Uh, I think that they're going to win. And I think... <laughs> I think we're, we're screwed, basically. Can I say the word screwed? Uh, we're screwed. Try not to say it too often. Let's, OK. Let's it like that. Is that, is That's that, your limit now. Is that, number one, is... Is that, is that the people who think in a certain way, everything's been siloed, as you know, yeah. and uh, this silo, which is, which is sort of like saying, you know, men are men, are men and women are women, and, you know, may, is... is you think has, they're going to win? I mean, it's interesting yes, because... because the young people have the future belongs to Hitler. Remember that, <laughs> remember that song in... Uh, I don't remember what was this. that? In... Um, no, no. In, um, I, uh, no, I cabaret. In cabaret, yes. is the young people were a, a lot. These people are very young audience, but yeah. generally speaking, Lewis, I, I refuse to believe the younger generation are, are going along with all of these authoritarian ideas. I'm well, not, I think there's a contingent that are, but I would suggest, I suggest, when it comes to just men punching women, I would like to think the younger generation are, aren't on board with no, that. Because the, the younger generation feels for the trans people. We we don't. A lot a lot of times we don't. Or we don't feel as much. And well, you feel like you feel. Yeah, but it's how are you defining trans people? Yeah. Trans people, are we talking about guys who just like wearing dresses and then suddenly that makes they, them more women? We talk about people with gender dysmorphia. The young, yes, the young people are thinking that those people are genuinely at risk. I think from... what they're doing is they're confusing what we used to call old school transsexuals with transvestites, crossdressers, fetishists, and they're um, putting them all in one umbrella, including yeah. violent men who want to punch women and go along to these events as an excuse for violence against women, quite clearly, right? I no, mean, there's a... I mean, the, the, it's an incredible misogynistic undertone. Not even undertone, it's overt. Yeah. You know, you see, we were talking about J.K. Rowling earlier, to see the death threats, the rape threats. And the irony, of course, is that you've got a bunch of people saying that they're women, but behaving like the worst of men. 
Yeah, it's an interesting one, isn't it? If you if you want people to believe that you're a lady, don't send rape threats and death yeah. threats to people because it's just not very ladylike. <laughs> I'll be honest. Okay, next up on Free Speech Nation, we're going to speak to a counsellor who ran into trouble when she had the audacity to ask why gender critical campaigners were being blocked from a stall at a women weekend. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> Nana Queer. Weekends from 3 p.m. Seriously couldn't get my head around it. Electric ambulances. The government are planning to spend our money, over half a billion, on a fleet of electric net zero ambulances. Even being told this alarm bell should be ringing, most of the people I know who have an EV have got rid of it because of the range anxiety and the inconvenience having simply just got too much for them, frankly. They never do as much as they say they won't, will anyway. First of all, they are totally impractical. The ambulances will take some four hours to charge each, so it will be out of action for that time. They will need space and individual chargers and having... And heaven forbid they need to do more than the 70 to 80 miles capability, which will be somewhat diminished depending on weather conditions and presumably the use of life-saving equipment to keep their patients alive, which I'm guessing will be powered by the same battery. Apparently, the NHS is committed to making all new emergency ambulances electric by 2030 and the entire fleet by 2045. In England alone, this would cost over £600 million. While electric cars don't produce any emissions from the tailpipe, there are emissions involved in the manufacture, as well as the production of the electricity used to charge them. So anyone driving an EV thinking what a great job they're doing needs to think again. Ambulances are usually changed every five years, and at about £150,000 per vehicle, the new EV version would need to be on the road for over 15 to make it commercially viable. So why should the public pay for this? In my view, it's commercially irresponsible and putting our lives at risk for the sake of an ever-questioning green agenda, which will bankrupt the country and is not in the best interest of the patients. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you... PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. to Free Speech Nation with me, Andrew Doyle. There was a noteworthy incident earlier this month at Chester Story House's oh, Women Weekend. A number of campaigners had been disinvited from holding a stall at the event on the grounds that their gender-critical views were intolerable. And local councillor Mandy Clare asked for an explanation. And let's have a look what ensued. This event, and this event is called the Story House Weekend for women. Not for men, for women. So aren't you being hypocritical in saying that you defend the right of freedom of speech and protest and yet lying about the women who've been disinvited from this event who are peacefully protesting for women? So when I say I, I agree with the freedom of speech, as long as you're not hurting anyone, and what people are doing is being transphobic and perpetuating ideas that are dangerous, and lead to trans people being murdered. Patsy. So please leave. Patsy. Thank you so much. Are you serious? Thank you so much for the question. Did I say why? You what, what, what reason? This event That's, is to celebrate women. Did I break the law? What are you doing? Celebrating women. Not, okay, did I say anything? And I apologise to my followers else. or anyone who's had to deal why with this today. Why was the question today? then? Because it's important. Like when I was first arrested. And Councillor Mandy Clare from the Party of Women joins me now. Mandy, welcome to the show. That, 
that's an astonishing clip. Um, you stood up and you asked a legitimate question, you know. Can you give us some context about what happened there? Sure. So um, I'm kind of known locally as a councillor who re raises concerns and issues around um, women's rights, women's dignity, our language, um, child safeguarding concerns, etc., in relation to the debate around uh, sex and gender. So the women got in touch with me. Um, they had applied for a stall at an event called the Women Storyhouse Women Weekend. So Storyhouse is a local theatre in Chester. Um, I'm a local councillor in Cheshire West in Chester, mm -hmm. and I felt um, it would be good to go along and support the women. When they got in touch and said that they'd been disinvited um, because they declined to go on a, a panel with Patsy Stevenson. Um, I was kind of even more interested in going along to support them, but they were very concerned that it wouldn't be interpreted as them causing any kind of disruption. They just wanted to go and hand out leaflets, which is what they'd intended to do as part of the um, as stall holders at the event in the first place. Yes. Um, just to let women know that there is an organisation out there that does centre women locally, that they can join and get involved in if they want to. Um, so there were some women outside leafleting. Um, the police were called three times in total by Story House. I attended um, Patsy Stevenson's panel event and whilst I was in that event, I noticed that she tweeted and described the women as um, uh, GC. She didn't say GC women or people. She said, there's a group of GC outside the event. I'm really sorry to any of my followers. Please don't speak to or engage with them. Um, that she'd understood it, that they were there to aggressively challenge and create media, social media content, and which by, they weren't. By GC, you mean gender critical, and, and she's effectively smearing these people and saying yeah. they're there to cause trouble to get films yes. of your reaction to post on social media. Yeah. Now, we should say, so this is odd, isn't it? Because this is a women weekend. Mm -hmm. uh, women are disinvited. Yes. Patsy Stevenson became well known because of the Sarah Everard visual, she vigil, did. isn't it? Yes, she did. So she, because yeah. she was taken away by police. Mm -hmm. I think we've got some images of, of, of that we can maybe show. And you'll recognise these images because they went viral at the time. But she's standing there saying that you need to get thrown out. I mean, she did say that, didn't she? That... She did, yeah. So basically, I just asked her some reasonable questions. I asked her because she uh, earlier commented that she was in favour of freedom of speech yes. and the right to protest, regardless of whether people agreed with her views or she agreed with theirs. In principle, she was in support of that. But then she denigrated these women and lied about them. Yes. Um, so I asked her, you know, why, uh, given that basis, why did you do that? And are you aware that they're just outside leafleting because they don't want women to have to refer to their rapists? Is she in court? They don't want disabled women to be forced to have intimate um, care from men yes. if that's not what they want. Um, they don't want women to be intimate and strip searched by male police officers who are claiming that they're women. Um, these, you know, that, that's what the women have been disinvited for. Um, and her response was that she's in favour of freedom of speech, but not if it hurts people, and that people are being transphobic and that trans people could end up being murdered by such dangerous questions, I guess. Uh, uh, yes, it's, yes. it's quite unbelievable, the, the leap that she's <laughs> making there. Um, what about this? I mean, you had a, then you had the running with the security guard. They were quite bullish, weren't they? I think we yes. might even have a clip of that. Mm -hmm. If we can perhaps show that, that would be quite helpful. No, maybe it's... Pardon? You need to leave the premises. You're chucking me out of the premises. No, you won't. No, you won't take the camera off. I, I will. No, you can't. I know I'm all right. You can't take it off. If you are... No, I'm not breaking any laws. By all means, get the police in. Why do it? to protest and defend women's rights as well yes. at a women weekend. Yes. So what's going wrong here? I mean, you've faced this, uh, you've had to raise these issues with the council before, haven't yeah. you? I mean, on one level, it's not surprising because as a councillor, whenever I try and raise really important issues, including ones that are impact child safeguarding, um, I'm shut down. So there are enough Labour councillors within the chamber of 70 councillors in total to make sure that debate, they vote against debate every time I try to bring a motion to council. Can you give an example of that? Yeah, so, for example, um, at Chester, uh, Chester Pride, um, the charity that runs that, I'd contacted them ahead of Chester Pride just to ask them what safeguards have they got in place so that children, as has happened in lots of different places, aren't as exposed to sort of adult sexualised behaviour, fetish wear, that kind of thing, mm. that that's going to be kept separately from where children are, that it's not going to be hostile to anybody on the basis of their legally held views, you know, if you believe that men and women are different and sex matters in certain situations and that that's important. Um, I didn't want there to be any kind of hostile environment towards uh, people attending 
standing pride on that basis. Yeah. And they responded through officers to say, we think we know which councillor it is that's been asking these questions and we're not going to answer because um, we believe that they're hate motivated. And so when I asked the council to get involved, they said, no, if you need to take it up with them, you need to lawyer up, basically, was, was the response. And then we had strip tees in front of, you know, within an audience that children were in and out of that tent. It was called the glitter tent all day. Um, and sale of uh, sex toys, etc., in that same so you, environment. So the precisely concerns that, that you'd raised yeah. ended up... Happened. coming true. They happened and I had photographic evidence of it. Yes. Um, I mean, the rest of the event was fantastic apart from there was a sign that was sexist and that was hostile to women that wouldn't have, have shared, um, you know, um, a trans activist viewpoint, if you want to put it that way. Um, but when I tried to take a motion to council, they just slammed it closed as and, they always And they do. say it's hate and of course this isn't where hate is coming. Safeguarding yeah. of children is not yeah. hateful. No, it's not. And when I ask questions and when I send emails to the leader and to the chief exec about these things, including child safety, Garden, quite often I'll either get no response or, or they'll say you've already had an answer when I haven't had an answer and then they well, won't let you debate, local media don't cover it so it's really difficult to try and get this stuff out publicly. Well I, I, unfortunately we're almost out of time but I think it'd be worth just <clears throat> finally mentioning the fact that you're the first councillor from the party of women so is, yes. would you like to tell us a bit more about what you're doing? Sure yeah so uh, this is, um, so Standing for Women is uh, Kelly J Keane's um, organisation she's set up a, a brand new political party which is for women, it's, it's about women's rights, women's dignity, our uh, freedom of speech, all of these things that we've found have been crushed uh, in this way. And what I am going to be doing is working with Kelly J to try and encourage ordinary, um, you know, uh, people to come forward as candidates, not think that it's something that's beyond them, because I'm one of uh, 70 councillors and there's only two of us in that chamber who over the last, um, say, 12 months, 18 months, have been prepared to actually speak up on these issues. If you are someone who cares about these issues and you are willing to speak up on it, we're there to support you and you're already better than anyone else that's in your local council chamber in all likelihood so fantastic uh, mandy claire thanks so much for joining me still to come on free speech nation sal grover will be here to tell us about how she has been taken to court for not allowing a man onto her women only platform uh, but next i'm going to be rejoined by josh howie and louis schaefer we're going to get some more questions from this wonderful studio audience please do not go anywhere Hello, here's your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. We saw a quiet today weather-wise across the UK on Sunday, but things are turning more unsettled once again. During the week ahead, we wind and rain at times. A ridge of high pressure brought a quieter day on Sunday, but low pressure is already gathering towards the west and that will move in during the week ahead to return to unsettled conditions. Wind and rain already arriving across the west and southwest of the UK through the overnight period. Some of the rain turning quite heavy in places, whereas towards the north and east it's clearer, just one or two showers lingering, and certainly a touch of frost possible in the north and east by the early hours of Monday morning, whereas out towards the west and southwest, those temperatures will start to climb. As for Monday itself, with a very wet days in store across some western and southwestern areas, particularly across the southwest of England, some very heavy rain developing here at times. Whereas towards the north and east, it's a bright picture at least for time before wind and rain starts to move in from the southwest, turning to snow as it reaches colder air across parts of Scotland, especially on the hills north of the central belt and particularly later on in the day. Temperatures peaking at 12 Celsius down towards the southeast, a bit colder though towards the north and northeast. As for Tuesday, well, a very unsettled day is expected across Scotland. Rain and snow at times, snow chiefly on the hills, but some of that rain and some of that snow could be quite heavy. Elsewhere, it's a pretty unsettled day. Rain or showers never too far away. And those temperatures struggling, reaching uh, average figures at best, and staying pretty unsettled in the week ahead, with showers or longer spells of rain. And again, those temperatures struggling into the low double figures. Join me, Camilla Tominey, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tominey Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. 
Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back to Free Speech Nation with me, Andrew Doyle. Later in the show, I'm going to be turning agony uncle, as usual, with the help of my panel, Josh and Lewis. We're going to help you deal with your unfiltered dilemmas. So if you've got any personal problems, email us at gbviews at gbnews.com. OK, let's get some more questions. We're going to start a question from Peter. Peter, hello. Evening. Um, should the church embrace anti-whiteness? Yeah, this is the uh, Archde Archdeacon of Liverpool, Miranda Threlfall Holmes. It's a posh, double-barreled sounding name, that one. Uh, now, she hit the headlines this week because she posted that she said what the church needs is more anti-whiteness. There's the tweet. She said, I went to a conference on whiteness last autumn. It was very good, was it? She said, whiteness is to race as patriarch is to gender. So, yes, let's have anti-whiteness. Let's smash the patriarch. I think that's a quote from John's Gospel, isn't it? It's from the Bible. It's definitely yeah. Jesus. Jesus said, said it on the Sermon on the Mount. <laughs> yeah. He, smash the patriarchy. He, he too much wine. Demolish, like demolish whiteness. Yeah, anti-whiteness, yeah. Yeah, he was famous for it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this is uh, the, the. I mean, look, I don't want to get too involved in the church. Why not? So, well, no, just I don't want to tell them how to run their business. <laughs> uh, but they seem to. This is not good stuff. This is no, it's hateful. odd. It's anti very, anything. Like. Yeah, but isn't it weird though that the, the, the kind of woke ideas they really do infect religious or, or organizations. I mean, I was speaking to a Baptist minister, an evangelical Baptist in America. You think of them as being immune to this. They're saying they're talking about intersectional readings of the Bible, uh, decolonizing the Bible. Oh, it's inside, it's, it's at my synagogue. It's at your synagogue? Yeah, it's uh, because people want, people want to be good. Right. I get it. But also some people don't want to read. Yeah. So <laughs> they just want the good feeling of like, oh, I'm doing some stuff. She gets to go to some conference and get be fed a whole load of tosh. Yeah. And come back and go, look, look at me. I'm a really good person. Anti-whiteness, blah, blah, blah. And not actually read where this stuff goes but to. Do pe are people still at this point where they think that wokeness equals good, positive, liberal and not uh, racist, regressive, divisive. How have they not just read my book? Yes. Like, I don't understand that. <laughs> if you just read my book, you will get this. I mean, surely, you, I mean, you've read it, Lewis. I bought your book. I didn't read it. No, but <laughs> at least you bought it. I bought it. I bought it on Kindle. I, re I regret it because at least I have nothing to show for it. I can't bring it in and say, can you autograph it? But I bought the other one, too. And you didn't read that either? I didn't read that oh, one either. I mean, but, uh, <laughs> but, but that doesn't mean it's not a great book. The point is, <laughs> the point is, every dog has its day and white people, people who are white or Europeans, have had their day. <laughs> I, I have spent... No, I've spent my entire life wanting to be white. I'm a Jew. We weren't white. Uh, we were raised as black people. But uh, you know what, is, Lewis? Yeah. You've told this story to me before. It, it still confuses me. Yeah. Um, but listen, no, I do want to. We're not black people. We're not. Um, black no, people. I don't think you are. But what it is is <laughs> no. But we grew up in a post-Nazi world. I was born 12 years after the Holocaust, and we wanted to fit in with white people. My name, Lewis James Schaefer, was chosen because it was a white name that my mother... No, I, under I understand the point you that you're making. That? I used to go shop in Brooks Brothers to be, to be white. I'm dressing like a white man now. And, and I'm just I'm trying to pass. And I picked a losing team. <laughs> OK, you heard it here first. Whiteness is losing. Uh, let's get a question from Joe. Where's Joe? Hey. Hello, hello, hello. Hi. Um, my question is, um, do you think the Scottish police are trolling J.K. Rowling? And it, will that impact... Us, uh, let women speak on the 6th of April. Interesting. Uh, Joe, uh, well, let me explain that very quickly because there was a, there was a, we've talked about this hate crime that's coming in uh, in Scotland, and Police Scotland held a hate crime event. 
And at the event, they were given this fictional scenario and they said, look, there's this gender critical campaigner called Joe, but we're not saying who it is, but it's, jo you know, it, JK Rowling is known as Joe to her friends. And she insisted this campaign, this fictional campaigner, says sex is binary, says all the things that gender critical people say, and then says, oh, and trans people should be sent to the gas chambers, which of course no gender critical person has ever, ever said. It's a kind of horrendous smear, isn't it, Joe, against people who just wouldn't endorse that kind of violence ever. No. It's never, ever happened. It's just... De Let me ask you this. Is it possible that under the new hate speech laws, the police could be arrested for that? Because that seems quite hateful to me. Mm. Yeah. I mean, anything can be hateful. If it's interpreted, it's hateful. And you're, you're doing an event on the 6th of April. April. And can you tell me a little bit about that? Well, it's a Let Women Speak event in Edinburgh. In That's Edinburgh. enough. <laughs> <laughs> and, do you, I mean, do you think... Because I know that at those events you say things like, you know, biological sex is real and matters for women's rights. Will you get arrested for that? Potentially, yeah. I mean, potentially we could... I mean, if we say a man is a man... Yeah. Um, ..and someone is standing there and thinks he's a woman... Yeah. ..maybe he perceives that as hate speech, you know, and, you know, we could be reported. And isn't that interesting that this is... In a sense, it, people have to test the law. That's what's so scary about this, is that you're having to go there to do that. We're going up there with a comedy show. Again, what we're all doing, really, is testing the law. Fighting it. I think, as well, they'll end up getting in such a mess because other people will do it back, you know? You yes. will fight fire with fire. Yes. So they'll be in such a mess, the police will have so many... That's a very interesting point, I think, because, you know, obviously anyone can make a complaint. If the police are saying, we will investigate all complaints, well, then maybe we'll complain about the police. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I just want to say one thing. I've been to some of these events when they've been in London. They're great. They're incredibly inspiring, hearing women talk and telling their stories. It's also the only place that I've ever been where they have identified me as a man. <laughs> and that's yeah. quite encouraging. It's good. <laughs> yes, yeah. Josh, that's very important for Josh. But I just yeah. want to say one more thing about this. Very quickly. The other thing is why it's so offensive as well, is that equating uh, J.K. Rowling or anybody or the trans saying that they, they, they're trying to make this, create this narrative that trans people have something to do with the Holocaust. They don't. And yeah. it's incredibly offensive to Jews. The Holocaust specifically refers to the Nazi extermination of Jews. And there's been a lot of stuff online about this. Yes. Where, and it, they were not targeted. There were four people who were killed, trans people killed. They were not targeted because they were trans, they were targeted, two were gay and two were Jewish. Yeah, but and knowing France... about history doesn't get you anywhere these days. They are, they do revise history. That's one of the tactics that they do. That's a topic I do want to come back to. Not now, but we haven't got time, but we, I do you want to discuss that later on because that's a very interesting topic uh, but look next on free speech nation i'm going to be joined here by sal grover who's been taken to the court in australia for not allowing a man onto her female only platform don't go anywhere britain's newsroom weekday mornings from 9 30. men's mental health, yeah. men are starting to talk a lot more. Yeah. You've been through a lot of stuff that uh, people don't know about. Yeah, I mean, um, the last few years for me have been very, very difficult. Um, people, don't, people see me on tour, performing, making music, um, but um, myself and my wife, um, you know, we went through um, two miscarriages, oh, um, wow. you know, and, you know, for us, that was a very devastating mm, of time and very difficult to, to, to know how to kind of process those emotions. Mm. And I guess as a man, I, I did the thing of bottling up my emotions and where I feel comfortable to, to be able to express myself is in the studio. Whereas, you know, she had obviously a different reaction to, you know, what happened to us because not only was it happening to her mentally, psychologically, but it was happening to her physically as well. And I think what something that she really would wanted to see from me was that sensitivity and that emotion. And I thought that as a man being strong was trying to bottle up my emotions and just show her that, no, mm. you know, that I'm, I'm being strong for her. Mm. But actually being strong was, is talking about it. Mm. And what's happened ever since I've started to talk about it is I've spoken to more men that have experienced baby loss. My wife forced out of me, you know, how do you feel? And I end up as a mess on the floor. I was exasperating, crying, mm -hmm. almost inconsolable. She was just holding me in her arms um, as we cried together, and we cried together. Um, and I didn't realise I needed that release so badly. Like I said, I've been able to speak to other men, and, and, and we've been able to cry together, and they've, they shared their own experiences, which they did similar to me. But actually, 
you know, as men, I feel like that conversation and that sensitivity and being able to be mm. emotional together. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. Welcome back to Free Speech Nation. Next month, Sal Grover, founder and CEO of Giggle, a female social network, is being taken to Australia's federal court for alleged gender identity discrimination. Now, this has occurred because she did not allow a male who identifies as female to use this female-only platform. Uh, a trans activist, Roxanne Tickle, is seeking damages, a written apology and complete access to the platform and the case could have major implications around the world and Sal Grover joins me now to tell us more. Sal, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, it's a long story and a lot of people here won't have heard of it because of course the media aren't covering this generally. So let's start with what happened. What was Giggle? Why did you set it up? So basically um, my mum and I created a female only social network. We wanted women to just have a female only space in the palm of their hand. I had no idea of this gender identity ideology at the time. This is 2018, 2019. I'd come from Hollywood. I was sort of in that Me Too world. Um, and we laugh quite frequently of, like, what are the odds of creating a um, female-only platform at the one time in human history when anyone's having any kind of debate over what that is? But it was a place for women to find roommates, freelance work, connect for um, lesbian dating or just to have a voice and speak freely. You had no sense this was controversial. No. I mean, quite the opposite, because, of I course... I thought that there would maybe be some men, you know, there's always that men are like, don't women have enough? Like, I thought there'd be a little bit of that. Yeah. But I, I literally did not think that anyone would go, men or women, you have to let them on. Yes. It never occurred and, to me. And so this is one particular activist, Roxanne Tickle. Have I got that name right? Yeah, Roxy Tickle. OK, it just sounds made up, doesn't it? But um... Tickle v Giggle, I mean, like... Like, yeah. <laughs> my previous life as a screenwriter, if I was writing a screenplay about the sex versus gender debate and I made the central court case, Tickle V Giggle, the first script note I would have gotten was, it's two on the nose. It's two on the nose. It's not, it's <laughs> like not that, possible. No one's going to believe that, but that, that literally is what How it did is. it get to the court situation, though? Because surely, like, if you're saying men aren't allowed, why didn't this Tickle guy just say, OK, well, like, this isn't for me? Yeah, you'd think. Um, no, so basically, um, so he... he um, onboarded the app, I removed him. I didn't... I don't remember removing him. It was quite... Thousands of men yeah. frequently would try to get on the app. A few would get through, we'd just remove them. Um, and it, it should be noted, I did not know that this person was transgender, had a gender identity, nothing. I saw a picture of a man and I acted accordingly. Yeah. And how could I know that someone has a gender identity? Yeah, of it's, course. I mean, it's, it's like you could tell me right now that you have one, Either I believe you or I don't. Yeah, yeah. You well, it's like I mean? saying, you could say it. It's like telling an, uh, an atheist, I have a soul. Yes. And so do you, and uh, it, insisting that you believe. Yes, it's just so happened it's been legislated. <laughs> so this yeah. is the problem, isn't it? It's at, uh, Australia's federal court. It's gone that high. Mm. Uh, so what, how is this going now with the court case? What's so happening? basically, he did an Australian Human Rights Commission complaint against me, um, at me and Giggle, so it was sort of two things at the same time, um, for gender identity discrimination. And to settle it in the Australian Human Rights Commission, which is basically a, a place you can settle things before they escalate to court, but I would have had to set, like, let him on, let all men who claim to be women on the app go to sex and gender education, which could only be re-education, yes. and um, moderate all contents and not to offend men who claim to be women. women. Is, and I was lot, like, no. A lot of apps are doing that. I mean, there are, there are lesbian dating apps which have people with beards. Yeah. 
who say they're she, her. Men with beards, yeah. Yeah, well, they're men. Yeah. And, and, and they're not even making the slightest effort not to look like men. So, I mean, it's odd, not that that would excuse it. Yeah, it, it, it's exactly. Like, I mean, I don't have any distinction between a man who makes effort and a man who doesn't. A man is a man. But um, basically, uh, because by me saying no to all of that, um, he filed in federal court, and that's where we are now. In two weeks, two weeks on Tuesday, we go to federal court to find out what a woman is. It's the first big "what is a woman" case. It's but, sex versus gender identity. But I think a lot of people will be shocked by this because they would have said, "Okay, you might say, you know, uh, there's a there's a debate going on in London about the Garrick Club. Should women be allowed into mm -hmm. that kind of thing?" But this, you're talking about a dating site. You know, I have gay male friends who are on Grinder who say mm -hmm. it's full of women now. Yeah. I mean, that, that, you know, sexual orientation is a form of discrimination. No, completely. I mean, it's it is time for I think gay men to go and create a new space. I mean, Grinder is it's gone. Like you can't you can't get it back. It's been so infiltrated by yes. this nonsense that just like sort of let it go, let them have it, go and create a new one. I I think that with that all of the institutions, I think that that's what has to happen. Um, but, that being said, I am the person who did go and create a new one, and so this yes. is what you're in for. OK, so I want to just broaden this out, because this has ramifications uh, across the world, doesn't it? Yeah. But before we get into that, can you just explain to me about the Australia situation? There are certain areas in Australia at the moment where it is illegal for women to gather without, without men. Yeah. You know, you can't have a, an all-woman uh, gathering, is that right? Basically, yeah. I mean, um, there was an organisation called the Lesbian Action Group who applied to the Australian Human Rights Commission for an exemption to hold a um, female-only lesbian event, which, like, there's any other kind of lesbian, of course, like, it's yeah, just implied yeah. lesbian would be female-only, but because of all of this nonsense. And the Australian Human Rights Commission said no. And so I knew that they were going to say no because the Australian Human Rights Commission has intervened in my case... Yes. ..in Tickle v Giggle um, as... It does sound funny group. every time you say it. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's like a publisher. My last name's Grover. Like, it's literally... It's a pantomime. Um, <laughs> but, no, basically, um, the AHRC intervened as Emicus Curie in Tickle v. Giggle. Yes. And they're on the side of gender identity. So, based, they intervened, saying there's a conflict here. We understand between sex and gender identity, but we're going to solve it with gender identity. Well, people don't understand how far it's gone in Australia, I don't think, because yes, it's absolutely. in all the political parties as well. Yep. I mean, I know it is here, but it's, it's worse in Australia, isn't it? It's worse in Australia because the fourth estate is completely captured, so we don't really have this. Yes. So, I'm in the UK because in Australia, I have emailed journalists, I kid you not, every day yes. for a year. No one will platform me. No one will talk about this case. So the uh, the main news channel over there is ABC, isn't it? Yeah. Won't even mention that this is happening. No, I mean the ABC. It's it's even worse than the BBC. They're they're beyond like the band playing while the Titanic sinks. Like they're in the yes. kitchen making breakfast, thinking that there's going to be a meal the next morning. <laughs> yes. Like they are going down with the ship. But it, what's interesting to me is that they don't even. Um, platform it from the other side. No. You would think, because usually they celebrate, like, you know, it's either anything a trans person does, they'll celebrate, or they'll say this person's so oppressed, but th they're not saying anything about it. Isn't that them. interesting? We've got a similar thing with the BBC here, ignoring the WPATH files, which we've yeah. spoken about before. Listen, uh, we've a lot more to talk about, so Sal, we're going to come back with Sal uh, Grover after the break, so please don't go anywhere. <laughs> A brighter outlook with Box Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, here's your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. We saw a quieter day weather-wise across the UK on Sunday, but things are turning more unsettled once again. During the week ahead, we wind and rain at times. A ridge of high pressure brought a quieter day on Sunday, but low pressure is already gathering towards the west and that will move in during the week ahead to return to unsettled conditions. Wind and rain already arriving across the west and southwest of the UK through the overnight period. Some of the rain turning quite heavy in places, whereas towards the north and east it's clearer, just one or two showers lingering, and certainly a touch of frost possible in the north and east by the early hours of Monday morning, whereas out towards the west and southwest those temperatures will start to climb. As for Monday itself, with a very wet days in store across some western and southwestern areas, particularly across the southwest of England, some very heavy rain developing here at times. Whereas towards the north and east, it's a bright picture at least for time before wind and rain starts to move in from the southwest, turning to snow as it reaches colder air across parts of Scotland, especially on the hills north of the central belt and particularly later on in the day. Temperatures peaking at 12 Celsius down towards the southeast, a bit colder though towards the north and northeast. 
As for Tuesday, well, a very unsettled day is expected across Scotland. Rain and snow at times, snow chiefly on the hills, but some of that rain and some of that snow could be quite heavy. Elsewhere, it's a pretty unsettled day. Rain or showers never too far away. And those temperatures struggling, reaching average figures at best, and staying pretty unsettled in the week ahead, with showers or longer spells of rain. And again, those temperatures struggling into the low double figures. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Time is ticking on your chance to win the Great British Giveaway. There's a massive £12,345 in tax-free cash to spend however you like, along with £500 in shopping vouchers for your favourite store, a games console, a pizza oven and a portable Sonos smart speaker. And the best news? You could be our next big winner just like Phil. Didn't quite believe it and still can't. Uh, and if I can win it, anybody can win it. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday the 29th of March. Full terms and Privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. GB News Breakfast. Every day from 6am. The Victoria and Albert Museum in London has been accused of calling the former Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher a villain. The caption read, over the years, the evil character in this seaside puppet show has shifted from the devil, which it was originally apparently, to unpopular public figures, including Adolf Hitler, Osama bin Laden and Margaret Thatcher. Well, let's talk to political commentator and housing expert Russell Quirk and former miner David Craddock. Good to see you both this morning. Russell, morning. what do you think? No, of course not. She's probably one of the two best prime ministers that this country's ever had, alongside Winston Churchill. Um, she was a woman of conviction, of proper ideology, and she literally pulled Britain up by its bootstraps. So, uh, no, she's a hero. How do you balance that out against the idea that she did, as Russell said, pull Britain up by the bootstraps. You were the sick man of Europe. We were the sick man of Europe, uh, as Russell says, but uh, her methods were not the means of getting us out of trouble. All she did was turn uh, finance towards the private pocket rather than to services. And as a result, Britain suffered in the long term. It's interesting that you bring that up, though, because um, a lot of people do look at the, the um, sort of perilous state our politics is in at the moment, um, and they, they quote people like Margaret Thatcher. They say, if only we had people who were a bit more like Margaret Thatcher, we wouldn't be in the trouble we're in now. It's just unfortunate she's not around now, because I think she put current politicians to shame, don't you? Yeah, but the, but the, the reality with this, Russell, to do that, she was quite happy to break a lot of eggs... Mm. And and she, and she did that without a lot of remorse. There's plenty more still to come on Free Speech Nation this week, including Alba MP Neil Hanvey on the Scottish hate crime bill, and more from Sal Grover coming right up. But let's get a news update first from Sam Francis. Andrew, thank you and a very good evening to you from the newsroom. Just gone eight o'clock and we start with news from Moscow where two suspects in Friday's deadly shooting at a concert hall have been charged tonight in court with an act of terrorism. Earlier footage from the Russian capital showed four suspects being taken into custody following that terror incident, which we now know has claimed at least 130 lives. The Islamic State terror group has claimed responsibility for the attack. However, Russia is continuing to link Ukraine, an allegation Kyiv has denied. Well, tonight, Russian security officials have published a statement saying they will hunt down and kill those who masterminded the attack, saying that wherever and wherever they are, wherever they are from and whoever they are, they will be found. Meanwhile, Ukraine is working to restore power supplies after Russia's biggest attack of the war so far on the Ukrainian power grid. 
The president, Vladimir Zelensky, says more than 200,000 people in Kharkiv are still in the dark. It's after Russia pounded Ukrainian power facilities on Friday, striking the country's largest dam. That attack killed at least five people and put Europe's biggest nuclear station at risk. It comes as more than 30,000 civilians have now been killed in Ukraine since the start of the invasion. Simon Harris has been confirmed as the new leader of the Fine Gael party, paving the way for him to become Ireland's youngest premier. It follows the surprise resignation of Leo Varadkar on Wednesday for what he described as personal and political reasons. Mr Harris is expected to become Ireland's youngest Taoiseach after the Easter recess. He said today that politics should be a force for good. The Chancellor has defended the government's record on affordable housing after claiming £100,000 a year is, he says, not a huge salary. Jeremy Hunt said it doesn't go as far as people may think for those in his Surrey constituency because of how higher house prices and the rising cost of living. It comes as the average price of a house in the UK is now around eight times the average income. and It was half that in the 1990s. The Chancellor told Camilla Tomini on GB News this morning that lower taxes will make a difference. The average house price is in that part of the world £670,000. Mm. If you've got a mortgage, if you're paying childcare, um, what looks like a very high salary doesn't go as far as you might think it would. If you look at the average salary in this country, £35,000, um, they have been feeling the pinch. And those people will see their tax bills go down by £900 this yeah. year. If you look at people on an even lower salary, uh, the lowest legally payable salary, the national living wage, because I've increased that to £11.44, they will see if they're working full time, their income go up by £1,800. In other news, chilling levels of harassment are posing a serious threat to social cohesion. That's according to an independent government advisor. A review led by Dame Sara Khan will be published tomorrow, showing that more than 75% of the public feel that they can't speak their mind. It suggests many people feel society has become more divisive and cites the case of a teacher who went into hiding after showing a caricature of the Prophet Muhammad during a class. It's understood the report tomorrow will recommend a series of measures, including a ban on protests within 150 metres of schools. And China is believed to be targeting Britain with a wave of cyber attacks aimed at interfering with the upcoming general election. The Deputy Prime Minister, Oliver Dowden, is expected to warn MPs tomorrow about escalating state-backed threats from Chinese hackers. MI5 have also revealed an exponential increase in their investigations into Chinese hacking activities. It comes after a report found that Britain is unprepared for a large-scale ransomware attack due to what's been described as a lack of investment. And finally, eight people have this morning been rescued after their fishing boat sank off the coast of Shetland, triggering a major rescue effort. A lifeboat and two helicopters were scrambled to the scene in the early hours after the 27-metre vessel activated its distress beacon. It had started taking on water in the rough seas and sank within just a matter of minutes. The early morning call-out saved all of the crew on board. They are now safe and were airlifted from their life rafts. Those are the latest headlines from the GB Newsroom. For more, you can sign up to GB News Alerts. Just scan the QR code on your screen or if you're listening on radio, go to our website, gbnews.com slash alerts. to Free Speech Nation. Now I'm going to continue my discussion with Sal Grover, founder and CEO of Giggle, a female social network who's been taken to Australia's federal court for alleged gender identity discrimination. Sal, can you tell us a bit more about why this is going to have ramifications for the world, not just what's happening in Australia? OK, so part of our defence in it is a constitutional challenge, and this is because Australia put gender identity into our Sex Discrimination Act in 2013. The Julia Gillard government, um, Australia's first female prime minister, um, put gender identity into the Sex Discrimination Act and took out the definitions of sex, man and woman. Right. You would have thought that's quite fundamental to it. Well, a... we're basically in the situation where we're supposed to believe that the Sex Discrimination Act has concrete definitions for 
like discrimination and act, but not sex, basically. Right. Um, but gender identity has the definition of basically gender identity is gender identity. It's circular. It's just well, mannerisms or well, something. Well, I always ask uh, trans activists what they mean by it. No one can give me a, a successful definition. Well, a few weeks ago, you had um, Robin Moyer White, I think his name is a, a trans activist barrister, no less, who you asked him what a um, what is gender identity, and he couldn't explain it. I'm being taken to federal court for discrimination of gender identity that someone even who claims to have a gender identity can't even um, define what it is. Well, Helen Joyce says it's something like a sexed soul. Exactly. So imagine legislating a soul, basically. Right. I mean, and how would anybody know? I mean, we don't... This is just made up concepts. But, but, th but this doesn't just, I mean, uh, you know, in Australia. So, well, let's firstly, if yeah. you were to lose this case in a couple of weeks, what would the ramifications be for uh, law in Australia? Well, so it's, it's not just Australia. It's, it is globally because basically Australia's Sex Discrimination Act um, incorporated CEDAW very much in full. So CEDAW is the Convention of the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. It is a UN convention and it is signed by 189 countries around the world, the UK being one of them. The only countries that haven't signed it are the countries you'd expect not to sign it. Yes. Um, but all the good ones have. And so CEDAW is a document that is based in biology, yes. in reality. It is females, m that men are not women. You could e very much say that it is um, against any form of what we were seeing now as gender because it's actually against any sort of sex stereotype discrimination of women, which right. I would argue that a man claiming to be a woman is a sex stereotype discrimination against a woman. So if you lose the case, then CEDAW has to be updated, is that right? Um, so if we lose the case... <sighs> If we lose the case, it basically means that in international law, woman is not defined as an adult human female. It, it, women's rights cease to exist. It, it, woman is a legal category that any man can identify into. Now, in a way, that's how it is at the moment. But what we're doing is we're going in and defending CEDAW and re-establishing that that's not how it should right. be. That it is very clear that CEDAW is female and a woman is an adult human female. And once we've established that, other countries like the UK, Canada, New Zealand, many countries in Europe that have all signed this can go and cite this case and this precedent and go, here we go, please give us our sex waste rights. Back. So the stakes are pretty high. Yeah, I just wanted to create an app for women. <laughs> I yeah. was not expecting to yeah, do yeah. this. So I'm like, oh gosh, this is a lot of pressure. Yeah. How do you think it will go? Well, on a good day, I think, like, it's a slam dunk. I, it, I, it's, a woman is an adult human female. Men can't be women, of course. I mean, this is just the truth. It's reality. This is objective. I mean, you can go and claim to be a woman if you're a man if you want. Like, that's freedom of belief. Think yes. whatever you want about yourself. I don't really care. But I, I care if you are forcing me to believe it. Yes. And so that's why where I go, like, this case... Like, this situation in general is even bigger than just women's rights, because it is freedom belief, and it's why men should care about it. It's why anybody, even, even if you are trans, you should care about it. You should care about having your right to freedom of belief. Yes. Because if you, if you don't, imagine not, imagine, imagine not being able to believe that you're a woman. Imagine that being legislated against. Well, that would be your rights being taken away. Well, our rights of actual reality are being yes, taken away from the us point. right now. OK, so the stakes are very high. We'll see how it goes. It's a couple, two weeks' time. Yeah. Um, good luck with it. Um, hopefully it will go the right way. Yeah. Um, you have a crowdfunder. We do, yeah. Um, how can people help you with this? So, basically, um, it, basically it's the equivalent of £250,000 is how much it costs. So it's 500000 Australian dollars. Um, if we have to go to the High Court, it will be another 500000 Australian dollars. So we have a crowdfunder, it's giggleCrowdfund.com. And more information about the case, just about the legislation, about CEDAW, the constitutional challenge, it is... It's all there. It's all there at uh, Giggle... Uh... GiggleCrowdfund.com. OK, well, we'll see how it goes. Sal Grover, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Fascinating stuff. Now, next on Free Speech Nation, we're going to hear from parents and clinicians who are issuing legal challenges this week to the controversial new treatment regime for young people who question their gender. Please don't go anywhere. This is GB News, Britain's news channel.
Yeah, well, when it comes to fish and chips, we all know they're a part of a British tradition and the Golden Chippy is, is an award-winning uh, restaurant and for years they've been serving the community here in Greenwich and even today on a Sunday they are fully packed today. But this is the issue. Here we've got a mural and which says a great British meal. Residents who live in this area who've complained uh, to Greenwich Council who say it's inappropriate uh, considering it's in a conservation area. Here's what some of the local people we've been speaking to had to say. What's wrong with it? It looks all right, doesn't it? Do you know what I mean? Look at some of the other they've got around in Greenwich. They don't want to take that down, do they? But when you've got something like this, it's half day, so they want to remove it. Fantastic artwork. I really like it. Reminds me of Banksy. Well, those are the views here from people who live in this local area. But I'm kindly joined by Chris, the owner. Thank you so much for your time this afternoon. You've been here for 20 years now. Um, tell, tell me how this issue has come up. They take pictures. It's only been up for about a month. And uh, it's been very, very popular. I don't want to believe that any of the locals are uh, complaining that this is uh, too loud or anything like that. They say it's, it needs planning permission. How a little thing like this needs planning permission, I don't know. Are you working with an artist in this local area? I've got a local uh, guy that uh, does uh, murals, so he said, uh, would you like me to do something for you? I said, yes, why not? I said, make sure you leave a bit of space for people to stand there so they can uh, take some selfies or pictures or whatever they want to do from Golden Chippy. And it's been extremely popular, and not one person has come to me and said, that looks terrible. So I cannot imagine the person that complained about this. I think it's just cancel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back to Free Speech Nation. So, parents and clinicians will be this week legally challenging the new treatment regime for young people questioning their gender. Nurse and a psychotherapist Sue Evans, who blew the whistle on practices at the discredited Tavistock Clinic, will seek a judicial review of the, government's re of the government regulator's decision to register gender plus healthcare, which can refer patients between ages of 18, 16 to 18 for cross-sex hormone treatment. And Anna Castle, the mother of a teenager with ADHD who wanted cross-sex hormones and a mastectomy, will be at the High Court this week seeking increased safeguards for teenagers referred to adult gender services. And Sue Evans and Anna Castle join me now along with Paul Conrath of Sinclair's Law, who is acting in both cases. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thank you. Sue, I want to come to you first because you were, one of, you were the earliest whistleblower at the Tavistock, which I believe is about to close now, finally, this week. Yes. Um, but, but, you know, you... You sounded the alarm, you raised concerns, you weren't listened to, really, were you? Well, they did do uh, a small internal report. Um, and, in fact, Dr David Taylor, who did the report at the time, found many of the concerns that actually, if you wound forward 15, 16 years... Yes. ..then became obvious in the more recent episode of Whistleblowers at the Tavistock. Yes. But my concerns back then was actually around a 16-year... 16-year-old child that I had seen referred after four sessions for a hormone therapy treatment. And I was just shocked by it because my way of working and my long experience in, in mental health work um, has always been that it takes time, certainly with adolescents and mm. young 
younger people that it takes time to gain trust to develop a relationship. And so an assessment, in my view, could never be done in such a short period of time. And we've talked a lot about on this show about how, you know, Hannah Barnes's findings about between 80 and 90 percent of adolescents refer to the Tavistock where same-sex attracted. There were other things going on in these people's lives. It's not necessarily about a mismatch of gender and body, is it? There's other things. That's right. And I think, I think the, the, the difficulty with what we're facing at the moment is, and what people are finding it so difficult to come together to think about is, that if you look holistically at most of the children, many, all of the children that I've met, in fact, there are complexities to their mm. life. There may well be ADHD, they may be on the spectrum, autism spectrum, neurodiverse in other ways. They can have mental health difficulties, they couldn't have experienced trauma. So you have to really explore all of that to understand the presentation. And, and in my view, and my clinical experience has been that if you help children come to terms with who they are and the sort of identity issues that they're struggling with, actually, those intense feelings of hatred for them, themselves and their body does tend to desist or die down, so yes, it's bearable. But the Labour Party's official policy now is they're saying that what you're just describing, that therapeutic approach, is trans-conversion therapy. That's what they're calling it. Well, there is a real concern around the conversion therapy bill, and I'm glad that it, it's been put on hold for a bit longer. I think what people don't understand is they, they get confused between, quite rightly, the, the sort of law that was against the idea that you would try and convert homosexuals to being heterosexual. I mean, I think now we would clearly say we're, we're all against that. And But, but actually, I, you know, I don't think I know of any single clinical um, uh, event where there has been conversion therapy cited and a complaint made. But the, the difficulty, again, is when you try and think in this area and, and talk about it and explore it and try and get to what is the best treatment for these children, mm. that's what I'm about. I want to give them the best opportunity. Um, is that you get shouted down or you get told that's conversion therapy. I never tell a patient what they should or shouldn't think. I just try and work with them to understand where they're coming from yes. and then gradually unfold the difficulties that they're experiencing. So, Paul, we've, we've learned that the that puberty blockers are dangerous, that they, can, they are connected to uh, uh, bone, bone problems and, and brain development problems, and now the NHS has banned them except for clinical trials. That's good and news. And except for, well, yes, certainly, but there are private clinics who will be able to exploit this loophole and use it anyway. Um, but then what does that, where does that leave people who are over the age of 16, 16 to 18, in other words? So if you're over 16, you can still go to the NHS for cross-sex hormone treatment. And if you do that, at the moment, there's been a change in policy last week. So you'll be assessed by your treating clinician, but then that has to go to an independent body who will then assess whether or not that has been the correct decision to prescribe cross-sex hormones. Yes. So that, in fact, is a move in the right direction by the NHS. In the private sector, of course, we've only got one uh, private clinic at the moment, recently been approved by the Care Quality Commission. There is no such independent oversight in that respect. So, and the concern is as well, is that the evidence for the treatment really is very, very sparse indeed mm. in terms of its safety and in terms of its effectiveness. Yes. So, Anna, tell us a bit about this uh, legal challenge because that's, there is that danger, there is that concern of those young people who are in that age bracket that they can, through, through very few consultations, jump straight to this kind of potentially irreversible uh, medication. I think it's insane because there's no other area of healthcare where there's such little safeguarding preliminary investigations for such a massive decision that these children, young people, yes. vulnerable, autistic, probably gay, probably lesbian people are making. And yes. I don't think that it should be ignored. I really don't think it should be ignored. And is it your hope that a legal challenge will, will, will resolve this in some way, that it needs to go to that point? Hopefully, with all the... Um, everything that's been pointed out with the lack of evidence... And yes the negative evidence that's showing all the um, risk factors of the surgical procedures, the um, hormonal procedures, yes. everything. There's, there's no beneficial um, 
nothing beneficial for it. Yeah, I understand. Well, um, I, I should say the, the government regulator is the Care Quality Commission. A spokesperson said best practice guidance for gender identity clinics was considered by internal specialist advisors during the registration assessment and the registration was granted subject to the condition that the regulated activity must not be delivered to under 16 year olds. CQC has not yet carried out an inspection of Gender Plus Healthcare Limited. And uh, the Gender Plus Hormone Clinic said, at a time when the NHS pathway has collapsed, with four years of waiting time, it is important that young people have the option of a referral to an alternative national multidisciplinary team of experts. Our service does not practice in any way that contradicts current NHS protocols for gender services. Um, but can I come to you on this, Sue? But isn't that the point that if someone, once they hit 16, it's almost as though they can go straight into... So, I mean, some of the concerns about puberty blockers was that, were that they always lead to cross-sex hormones in virtually all cases. But now people can just go straight to it in that sort of danger zone. Yes, and, uh, and what's so bemusing to me is that, you know, everyone knows that teenagers are in a period of development. Mm. We've acknowledged that throughout time, you know, that... So, so it is strange that such a powerful medication could be given on such a small level of assessment yes. to children that are still developing. And these are powerful drugs. They are irreversible. You go straight onto them and they will harm your body. We know that. Yes. We don't yet know that there's any evidence to suggest that they'll be effective yes. for the large majority of these children. And Anna, obviously, you've been through this in a, in a very personal capacity. I mean, you must have spoken to other people who are in this situation. There's a lot of people out there who are seeing people that they love go through something which they know can be very, very damaging indeed. I mean, how does that feel, do you think, to? There's hundreds, if not thousands, if not more than that, of families in identical situations to mine, yeah. my daughter. Yeah. Yeah. And um, there's no research going into it. We're just left. Our children are left. And um, indoctrination is ignored. And it's almost as though the medical facilities are, or certainly like the Tavistock, are just on board with an ideology and they're pushing an ideology and yeah. it doesn't really matter about the kids so it much. It doesn't. It doesn't. Everywhere is against us parents and our children wanting, or our children's need to have a quality life. Yeah, well, I should say that an NHS spokesman did say NHS England has said that a planned review of the service specification for adult gender services will take place this year, which will include an extensive process of public consultation. But, Paul, that is the problem there. Adult, the idea of competency. And once you get to 16, you are competent. You can pursue your own uh, treatment. But if you're only having a couple of consultations, the danger should be obvious. Yeah, I mean, there's two issues here. There's capacity to consent. So do you understand what's going on? Yeah. And then there is, is the treatment safe and effective? Now, the NHS have done, um, you know, through commissioning the CAS review, Dr Hilary Cass, an independent review, looked into this and said for under-18s, the evidence simply isn't there, mm. credibly, to say that in the long term, this is safe and effective treatment. Remembering this is a treatment that affects the rest of your life. Yes. And so if you're 16 or 17 and you go to the doctor, you want to be assured, in fact, that this is going to work. Yes. But in fact, we don't have the evidence. So this is, this is the problem. And the extraordinary thing is the NHS have changed the children and adolescent approach, which is up to 18, and you can only get hormonal treatment if you've gone through an in-depth assessment, psychological assessment. But the adult specification takes young people from 17. And if you're 17, all you need is two appointments, no need for a psychological assessment, and you can move straight onto the drugs. Drugs, medication that, can, that will affect you for the rest of your life. And it simply doesn't make sense. This is incredible, isn't it? Because we've been so focused on what, what to do with minors and we forget that as soon as they hit that age, they can just bypass all of that. So what, what do we do here, Sue? <laughs> it's, it's a hot potato to yes. discuss. I mean, I think really, if... I mean, I don't know if you're aware, but yesterday there were a, a, a large group of professionals came together to discuss the evidence base for the treatment of, of people with gender dysphoria or gender incongruence. Yes. Um, and they got shouted down, they got protested against and threatened with violence. And, and so it's, it's a real problem. I... 
certainly in my clinical experience, would like to see some special consideration given up to the age maybe of about 24, 25, because there is also a recognition that that the brain is still developing yes. and that maturity is sort of perhaps not finished maybe until we're in our mid-twenties. So, um, and of course you get shouted down. If yeah, but say, why is that? Why, you know, why are people um, ignoring the cast review? Why are people ignoring what medical experts are saying? Yes, again, I think there's a clash of the ideological um, with the clinical. Right. And I think if we could get back to medicine and clinical science and evidence base, I think we would be in a much better place to establish, actually, what is the best care for the patients mm. that we see? Because, ultimately, doesn't everyone who is experiencing this want to know that the medication they're about to be prescribed by their doctor is evidence-based? In any other area, you wouldn't want to just get something from your GP that was risky or hadn't been proved to work. Yes. And so why are we playing so um, carelessly, really, with, with young people's lives? OK, well, fascinating stuff. I'm sure we'll, we'll come back to this story. Uh, thanks very much for joining me, uh, Sue, Anna and Paul. Thank you very much. <laughs> Next up on Free Speech Nation, Neil Hanby, MP, is going to be here to discuss the Scotland Hate Crime Bill, which is due to come in force at the start of next month. Plus more questions from this lovely studio audience. Do not go anywhere. Hello, here's your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. We saw it quiet today weather-wise across the UK on Sunday, but things are turning more unsettled once again. During the week ahead, we wind and rain at times. A ridge of high pressure brought a quieter day on Sunday, but low pressure is already gathering towards the west and that will move in during the week ahead to return to unsettled conditions. Wind and rain already arriving across the west and southwest of the UK through the overnight period. Some of that rain turning quite heavy in places, whereas towards the north and east it's clearer, just one or two showers lingering, and certainly a touch of frost possible in the north and east by the early hours of Monday morning, whereas out towards the west and southwest those temperatures will start to climb. As for Monday itself, we'll have very wet days in store across some western and southwestern areas, particularly across the southwest of England. Some very heavy rain developing here at times. Whereas towards the north and east, it's a bright picture at least for a time before wind and rain starts to move in from the southwest, turning to snow as it reaches colder air across parts of Scotland, especially on the hills north of the central belt and particularly later on in the day. Temperatures peaking at 12 Celsius down towards the southeast, a bit colder though towards the north and northeast. As for Tuesday, what well, a very unsettled day is expected across Scotland. Rain and snow at times, snow chiefly on the hills, but some of that rain and some of that snow could be quite heavy. Elsewhere, it's a pretty unsettled day. Rain or showers never too far away. And those temperatures struggling, reaching uh, average figures at best, and staying pretty unsettled in the week ahead, with showers or longer spells of rain. And again, those temperatures struggling into the low double figures. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. 
On Mark Dolan tonight, the theatre venue telling white audience members to check their privilege at the door. Covid lockdowns, four years on, never again. Labour to hand more power to the unions, my reaction. And do the tragic events of the last couple of days remind us just how loved and important our royal family are? Plus Mark meets my pundit Anne Widdicombe and tomorrow's papers. We're live at nine. to Free Speech Nation with me, Andrew Doyle. Scotland's new hate crime law, which comes into effect on April Fool's Day, criminalises threatening or abusive or insulting behaviour, which is intended to stir up hatred against people based on age, disability, religion, sexual orientation and transgender identity. The act has proved controversial. The head of uh, complaints at the police watchdog says it could have a chilling effect on freedom of speech. But the bill's defenders say it is nowhere near as draconian as is being suggested and uh, protecting people from hate is long overdue. So joining me to discuss this, the Alba MP for Kakaldi, uh, Neil Hanvey. Welcome to the show, Neil. Uh, now, Hamza Youssef has come out and said there's been a lot of disinformation about this. People are overreacting. Uh, this bill is absolutely fine. Uh, is he right? Uh, no, well, I, I made a, a bit of a lighthearted comment on his claim that there's disinformation being spread about uh, this legislation uh, by saying he'd misspelled information. Uh, because what's really happening is that people are spreading the truth uh, about this legislation. And it's, you know, nobody is saying that um, hate crime should be uh, given a green light. Uh, but the, the, the way that this bill has been, or this act, has been constructed uh, is deliberately intended to prevent um, freedom of speech, freedom of thought, uh, freedom of belief. There are certain uh, elements that are excluded from the bill, particularly around gender crit critical beliefs, and most importantly, um, sex as a, a as a class. So, women's sex based rights are not covered by this bill. Uh, sex. The, the bill is silent on the definition of sex, and therefore, same sex attraction is effectively meaningless, uh, and it really has a chilling effect on political discourse. Uh, and I'm very concerned uh, about it. You know, the official line is there's nothing to see here, but actually there's a huge amount of concern about this legislation for all of the reasons that I've just covered. Well, we've invited the SNP onto the show. They haven't got back to us yet, so fingers crossed for next week. Um, but I would like to ask them, and so I'll just ask you instead, uh, can you give me an example of a, a crime or an incident that would be covered by this legislation that isn't already covered by existing criminal law? Well, I mean, all of the, um, the, the standard hate crime uh, uh, um, offences that we would ordinarily expect, inciting racial hatred, uh, inciting uh, uh, hatred against any religious minority, all of that already exists. What the Scottish government has done is they've reinterpreted the protected characteristics within the Equality Act. And so um, instead of it being a gender uh, reassignment, they, they called it gender identity, which is not a protected characteristic in law. Uh, and in my, certainly in my experience over the last five years, there have been a number of occasions where, you know, I've been spuriously accused of transphobia because I've spoken out in support of women's rights or I've spoken up for LGB rights and because I haven't spoken about transsexuals, which is a completely separate protected characteristic, um, again, I've been accused of all kinds of uh, terrible things. And what this legislation does is it emboldens those queer theory radicals, those, uh, th those people who uh, are um, intent on promoting queer theory, and that includes the Scottish Government, mm. uh, uh, to, to stamp down on those of us who are in touch with material reality and feel that our um, uh, sex-based rights contained in the Equality Act are directly under threat because of this legislation. Now, uh, the police have come out and said, you know, we're not going to target performers, we're not going to target uh, comedians, because there was some linked materials from a police training session where they were clearly preparing uh, for the situation where they might have to arrest a comic for uh, offensive speech. So they're saying they're not targeting. But are they not saying that, that they will investigate absolutely every complaint uh, that is made? Well, allegedly so. 
Um, but the, you know, um, the, the, the kind of complaints that I would be interested in the police uh, investigating are the, the types of assaults that have been happening on, on women in Scotland that have been dismissed as irrelevant. And that was, you know, I'm thinking of one particular uh, situation in Aberdeen where a woman was assaulted in broad daylight uh, in full view of many bystanders and the police uh, just effectively ignored that. Uh, but hearty words uh, are being pursued uh, uh, vigorously by the police. And it's that um, incongruence in the way that the law is being interpreted that really is giving everyone uh, such a cause for concern. And didn't they just put out a recent statement saying that they were going to with, uh, reduce the number of uh, crimes that they investigate? They're not going to bother with certain forms of vandalism or theft uh, yeah. if they think they can't be solved. So, in other words, they'll leave actual crime and they'll go after, spend all this time on uh, offensive words. Yes. So, I, I mean, that's ab absolutely correct. So, the police are, in, in Scotland, the police are under enormous pressure. I know that firsthand. I've met with um, local senior commanders and uh, inspectors, and uh, I know that they are under massive pressure, but they are now being instructed that they have to investigate these types of um, uh, non-crime hate incidents. Uh, I know that that's been something that's been remedied down south uh, because there was a a rash of um, uh, police activity around those types of non-crime events. But there's no such uh, protection or prevention of those kinds of events being investigated and you, the, the individual being placed on some form of register or list, which could impact on their employment, their future employment, their... Uh, uh, you know, their, their general livelihood. And the most important thing is, even if uh, there is no crime, and even if nothing comes of the charges that are brought, the process of being investigated, of having to go through a criminal trial, of having to defend yourself. Uh, uh, there's a, a saying in Scotland that we've all become very, very used to, even before this came in uh, into effect, is that the process is the punishment. Uh, and that, that, that intrusion into your life, the loss of your IT equipment, confiscation, uh, you know, the, 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 um, having your name plastered all over the, the newspapers, dragged through the media, being there my, myself, that's all uh, part of the punishment that these vindictive uh, queer theory um, extremists want to inflict on people. And, you know, the, the, the wrong target has been... Uh, is being protected by this law. There is nothing to prevent uh, this type of extremism being stamped down upon by this legislation. Hmm. And there is nowhere for women to seek protection for their sex-based rights or indeed same-sex attracted people to be protected for their uh, sex-based rights in this legislation. And that's okay. a mission tells you everything that you need to know about the real motivation behind this legislation. Neil Hanvey, thanks very much for joining me. Most welcome. And I should say, I'm very keen to have someone on next week who will defend the bill. I really want to hear the other side of that argument, so hopefully that will happen. Uh, let's get some more audience questions now. This one comes from Iris. Where's Iris? Hi, Iris. Hello. Hi, um, What's your question? Um, we know that the BBC left um, Stonewall's... Um, Indoctrina indoctrination last year or maybe just a little bit before. Yeah. Does Stonewall still influence BBC policy? Well, that's... So, John Humphrey said that, hasn't he? He said that... Because uh, the, 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 there was this situation... I don't know if you saw this on, 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 uh, on the news about Justin Webb. And Justin Webb had referred to a trans woman as male on the Today programme. There was then an internal investigation. There'd been a complaint, and the complaint was upheld uh, by the BBC. Um, Josh... But haven't they officially severed links with Stonewall? I mean... Yeah, but this stuff goes deep. Right. Uh, and it... Uh, what was, I, there's a deeper problem within the BBC that they mark their own homework anyway. Yes. Uh, but, yeah, a few, and, and this is also... There's been a lot of complaints from senior female journalists who have said, what, what, what does this mean in terms of us actually reporting the truth, which the BBC is meant to be impartial. Yeah. And on these matters and other matters, they've proved that they're not. And then when Tim David goes before the board this week and sort of says, oh, we're just trying to be kind. I mean, that's the problem all along. He also says that the, the, the trans issue isn't really that important. Well, he says it's been ramped up. They always up. want to say that it's like some culture war big thing and yeah. it's used by the right to kind of 
bash the left and everything. It's like they need to grapple with this stuff yeah. because it is important. Well, they're just ignoring it. I mean, still no report on the BBC News website about the WPATH files, one of the biggest medical scandals of the century. Not a peep. That, I think, is just dereliction of journalistic responsibility. How can it be otherwise? Yeah, and now they're seeing, that, seeing their journalists getting shut down for calling a trans woman male. Yeah. Well, then, what's the, how's that going to inspire other journalists so to, the, yeah. to, to, to take the stuff? But this is the issue, isn't it, Lewis? I just don't think the BBC can credibly say that they are impartial anymore. They might be impartial when it comes to party politics, or at least strive to be, but they make no effort whatsoever to be impartial when it comes to ideology. They're, they're part of the cult. They're not part of the cult. It's the state propaganda network. They're not a real broadcaster. You don't have the you don't have the state reporting news on itself. Or on a, so you're asking an impossible thing. You're asking for for someone who's deep who who is has a position to be. No, but the BBC is not just there to defend the government. The, the BBC, BBC. No, Lewis. They hold the government to account, or at least they they no, meant to. But no, when it comes not to this meant issue, to, because they, I'm not saying that they are the government. I didn't say the government. I didn't use that term. I said they're the deep state. They are. They're from. This is yeah. you know something, I, a so Andrew. I'm, Andrew, I'm, I'm going to. I'm going to come to you in a minute. Yeah. Um, no, I think this is the main... Sorry. I, I just want to say something. It's propaganda by omission. Propaganda it's... by omission is probably the key phrase yes, and there. who is doing the propaganda? The be... yeah. And the fact is, why do you care about it? You care about it because it's paid for by us. If it wasn't paid for by us, you'd say, well, fine, let them say whatever no, they want to say. No, but you say that then. Everyone's trying to shut down GB News and no one pays for us. Yes, apart... and that's also wrong. They shouldn't shut down us. I'm not saying you should shut down the BBC, but we should say we're not paying for it. And then, then you wouldn't mm -hmm. care. Let them okay. spend their own money if there's some rich guy, like, you know, who wants to front that kind of ridicule. I do want to get another question in, so let's go to Justin. Where's Justin? Oh, he's over here. We'll just get the mic to you, Justin, uh, and then you can ask your question. Hi. Uh, is it fair to, com um, to cast Maggie Thatcher as a contemporary villain? Yes, and um, Maggie Thatcher has been bracketed alongside Adolf Hitler and Osama bin Laden in a display at the Victoria and Albert uh, Museum. And it, the, the caption is next to this uh, Victorian Punch and Judy puppet thing. It describes how the evil character shifted over the years from the devil to what it describes as contemporary villains. And the VNA says, uh, the VNA is always open to feedback from our visitors in response to some concerns around a caption in the Punch and Judy case of our Life in Matters display telling the story of British satire and comedy. We will review the label and update the wording. Were they being satirical then? No, they weren't being satirical. They were being ideologically driven. Uh, as, as has been proven by other issues with the VNA in the past, but it's weird, it's isn't offensive. it? <laughs> I grew up where she was the villain, so she—they're correct. But to put them, to put her within that context of two of the most evil people, she wasn't the, the villain to everyone. She was the villain. No, no, she yeah. was, but she, but so, well, in my household, she was the villain. I'm and, sure. Uh, yeah. But but the point is, that's just it, it, she was like a byproduct, a punchline. She yes. was literally. She was used. But she wasn't Osama bin Laden. No, that's what I'm saying. So the context here is incredibly offensive. Isn't that weird? Again, Lewis. Well, the fact is, is that people are paying for it. The people are paying for it. it comes sixty-seven million dollars go to the Victoria and Albert Museum. Pounds, from... and pounds in this country, mate. What? Pounds. Pounds. Whatever. <laughs> whatever dodgy currency you're using. And, uh, and, and it's uh, and it's it's, it's because. Mad. And and you want to know something, Andrew? You, Quickly. This is the thing about you as a British person. You're always missing the big issue. You're always talking about freedom, but. What kind of freedom do you have when you're forced to pay for this kind of dodgy stuff? Okay. And number two, you're always missing the other point, which is there's a lot of people who think Margaret Thatcher is evil. Okay, I don't because I'm an American and grew up loving the woman. But a no, lot I'm of aware that lots of it, I'm aware of the strength of feeling. That, but anyway, yeah. let's quickly get one more question from Natalia. Where's Natalia? Hello, hi. Did Shakespeare uh, make a theater uh, to um, men? Uh, white men and this is gender. Uh, okay, so this is the Arts and Humanities Research Council, which has funded a study by academics at the University of Roehampton, and they've said that uh, basically uh, Shakespeare was what white male cisgender and shouldn't really be bothered yeah. with anymore. Here's, uh, here's eight hundred thousand pounds of, of more of more t taxpayers' money yeah. going towards this stuff. They're, they've still got two years. I feel yeah. like this study should be stopped straight away and regain any money that they can from yeah. this. And it's ridiculous. Like you're judging him of a time hundreds of years ago where there, you know what, there were a lot of white men back then. 
It's, it's <laughs> odd, isn't it? It's yeah. odd. <laughs> uh, and then trying to impose queer theory onto these plays. I mean, it's well, completely it's like, anachronistic. Well, it's like what they were doing with Joan of, uh, Joan of Arc. Yeah, yeah. And all the, anybody who, any female in the past who wore a pair of trousers is... Uh, <laughs> Basically non-binary. Yeah. yeah, suddenly non-binary. OK, look, next on Free Speech Nation, Lee Anderson takes on the fire brigade and Jeremy Hunt says £100,000 is not much of a salary. It's almost time for social sensations. Please do not go anywhere. Nana Queer. Weekends from 3 p.m. OK, this is getting beyond ridiculous. Trans women, which, as we know, are biological males, are apparently now going to be included as women in a push to get more female chief executives into the FTSE 100 by it next year. Now, the campaign called 25 by 25 is an initiative headed by Chief Executive Tara Kemelin jones whose mission is to get 25 female chief executives running blue-chip companies by 2025, and it's backed by major companies including Unilever, NatWest and BP. You couldn't make this up. Tara said anyone who identifies as a woman is a woman. What's the point? Seriously, if anyone can say that they're a woman, then why bother with this at all? It just makes a mockery of the whole thing. Will the trans woman have a salary of a man or a woman? As we know, there are still major gender pay gap inequalities, and it will be a complete misrepresentation of women or, and on boards of pay and average salaries. Only last month, Tory MPs accused the financial services watchdog, the FCA, of putting women's rights at risk by encouraging banks to collect staff data based on self-identified gender rather than biological sex. Of course, it was met with resistance from some 40 MPs and peers who wrote to the Chancellor to argue that the FCA was taking an activist approach to its diversity policies. This morning, I read about a school, a health nurse who claimed that not all people who have babies might call themselves a she or a woman or a mum. She said that walking through a school in a skirt and letting your hair grow when actually people previously knew you as a boy, well, that's incredibly brave. That's what she said. But I think there's an element of attention-seeking, if I'm totally honest. But the worry is it could lead to a path of medical transition when most people going through puberty are struggling with their gender identity in any case. Biology trumps ideology, and it's time to take a stand. Big news, big debate, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. to the final part of Free Speech Nation. It's time for Social Sensations. That's the part of the show where we look at what's been going viral this week on the dreaded social media. Now, first up, Reform MP and GB News host Lee Anderson tried to find out from the head of the Dorset and Wiltshire Fire Authority why her force had been branded institutionally racist. And he didn't have much success. Let's have a look. I think you, you was in agreement that your force was institutionally racist, is that, is that correct? I agreed with the, with the report, the okay. um, independent report, and so did the Chief Offer Fire Officer accept yeah. the findings okay, so of that Can report. you please tell me, uh, Councillor, what unfair <laughs> advantages white people have in your force? I would hope not, none. Not advantages. Did I hear you yeah, Do they correctly? have any advantages? No. Then how can you be institutionally racist? Um, I... I, I, I Sorry, I, I might have to get back to you. I mean, this happens all the time, but didn't it happen in America where Princeton University said, we are, they confessed, we are institutionally racist. So the Department of Education said, OK, well, we will investigate you and not give you your funding then. You can't have a race, it's against the law. But they don't really mean it, do they? No, no, they just want to it's virtue signalling and going, yeah, we're, we're baddies and we're going to do better. But it's like, well, how are you better? And that's what he, and he called them out on it. And it was quite clever 
way of phrasing it in a way that she suddenly sort of revealed the whole thing to be uh, Emperor's clothes. Well, I want to know. Um, I want to know. But, Louis, like, like there, there are such things as inst uh, racist institutions, yeah. racist systems, like Jim Crow was a racist system. It was built in. But when a modern-day university says, yes, we are institutionally racist, I want to know, OK, what aspects of your institution are racist? Who put them there? Yeah. Why do you have these systems in place? And they don't, because they're not. No, they've got a conflicting view. On one hand, they do think they're institutionally racist. They hate do themselves. They? Yes, that's the problem with the Western world, is that people hate themselves. So when they, they think, I'm bad, I'm against the patriarchy, I'm against white people, like that woman in the other story, where she's, like, anti-white, they do believe it. But at the same time, they want their funding. Well, I tell you what, the American universities are institutionally racist because they uh, discriminate yeah. against uh, Asian Pacific people. Yes. Yeah, they, they, they have to get much higher marks to get in because they all do so well. Yeah, but that's not considered racism. But it is uh, racist. I, mean, I know it is. This is the thing about you, Andrew. God bless you. <laughs> you, you, you see hypocrisy. Yeah. You see that. And peop some people don't see it. Some people don't see it as hypocritical. When I was a kid, they didn't let Jews in to these universities yeah. because there were too many smart Jews. Now, obviously, we've declined. <laughs> <laughs> Speak for yourself, Lewis. OK, we're going to move on now. Uh, next up, Chancellor Jeremy Hunt appeared on the Camilla Tomini show this morning tried to defend his surprising claim that £100,000 is not a huge salary. Let's have a look. A hundred grand is not a large amount of money to earn? Well, um, I was talking to a lady who was explaining to me the average house prices in that part of the world, £670,000. Mm. If you've got a mortgage, if you're paying childcare, um, what looks like a very high salary doesn't go as far as you might think it would. I don't know. I mean, if the, if the average is, what, 35 grand? Yeah. 100,000 is more... It's three times as much, right? Yeah, and it, 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 it's, it's so ridiculous that in an election year, you have a chancellor speaking this way... Yeah, uh, read the it's room. It's so out of time. Yeah, I mean, for goodness and, sake. And even if you think double that... Down on I know. It, it's, it's insane. 100,000... I mean, I know you earn a lot more, but... You know, from your other projects. Yeah. Mel not, not from this. No, not um, from this, The no. mugs, the calendars. Yeah, you make yeah. a lot. But £100,000, do you think that's enough? Would you be happy with that? You know what? I understand that I grew up in a rich place, in a rich town, in a rich city, in the greatest country in the world, and you want more money. And maybe that's the problem with the British people, is they don't have high expectations. They've just such low expectations. You always bring this back to the problem with the British people. Because I'm you in hate this country. us. You hate I our country. I don't hate you. I just think you could have you could be modified to be much better. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Let's uh, now talk through some of your unfiltered <laughs> dilemmas. I'm going to clip that bit and put it online. That's perfect. Okay, our first dilemma comes from Seb. Seb says, I was out for drinks with friends this week and it was my turn to buy a round. I ordered and the bartender asked me to pay before he had made the drinks. My friends say that's normal, but surely you pay once you've received the service you paid for. It doesn't seem like a great dilemma. I guess bartenders just have different uh, procedures. Actually, I used to work in a bar. No, you, you, you pay. Uh, and then you ate the drinks? Yeah. It's just like you just get that bit out of the way. Is that right? Yeah. And especially I mean, if, it's a, I... if it's a cocktail... Yeah, just, it, what's, what's the, why is, what, what, 10 seconds gonna make that much of a difference? Uh, what do you think, Lewis? Well, it depends if their patrons were black. What do you mean? <laughs> it, it depends. If they're black, it's racist. If they're white, it's not racist. Obviously, these are not well, white. This isn't an issue of race. We're talking about... No, race. I'm saying, what I'm saying, that sounded worse than I meant. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to clip that bit. OK, That's... very quickly, Lewis. We've got to have another one. Our second dilemma comes from Kelly. Kelly says, I went on a first date this week and he said he had tickets to a comedy show. What he failed to mention was it, it was at the Royal Albert Hall. How on earth do I top this for our second date? Well, Palace of Versailles, probably. Something like that. What do you think, Lewis? Wait, wait, I missed the first part. I was uh, thinking, oh, you weren't like, listening. No, I was thinking about what, what I said before, which could be oh, for goodness. horrendous. Uh, my, I suggest... No, uh, let's go to Josh, then, because he was what listening. Is the, what is the first place I think, the first date? Uh, if I just may be so bold, a threesome. <laughs> uh, you are being bold. I don't think that's a very good idea. Uh, I think that's terrible advice. I think just... Uh, do you know what? Don't worry about topping the other person's date. They take you to the Albert Hall. Take them to a little chef. It's not about that. It's about the company. It's about being a good what, human being, isn't it? Wait, no, they, no, no, ignore him. Ignore him. I was paying, I was paying, so they took it to the Albert Hall, and now where do they go? Because the first place was... There. But it's the Albert right. Hall. There's 5,000 seats there. It's not such a special It's, not, it's very impersonal, isn't it? OK, well, look, thanks for joining us for Free Speech Nation. This was the week when Shakespeare was denounced for ruining theatre. Maggie Thatcher 
Fisher was branded a villain, and Jeremy Hunt said 100 grand wasn't really all that much as a salary. Thanks to my panel, Josh and Lewis, and to all of my guests this evening. And if you want to join us live in the studio and be part of our wonderful audience, you can easily do that. You can apply at www.sroaudiences.com. Stay tuned for Mark Dolan tonight. That's coming up next. And don't forget, Headliners is on every night at 11 o'clock. That's the late night paper preview show where comedians talk you through the next day's top news stories. Thanks ever so much for watching Free Speech Nation. Farewell. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, here's your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. We saw it quiet today weather-wise across the UK on Sunday, but things are